Next demo up is by a cook who served in engineering and business development for a major aerospace manufacturer whose clients included Boeing, IBM, and Northrop Gorman. Sounds like maybe Chris should send him a test model of the uh, the new thermometer with the uh, aerospace manufacturer background. Maybe he can solve some of the uh, some of the materials problems. Uh, the next presenter then obtained his Cicerone, BJCP, beer and mead certifications, and went full time with his own company, Gourmet Brewing. Please help me welcome the always great Doug Piper. In this video, I'm going to show you the five most important steps for preparing delicious steaks, quick easy and inexpensively. Hey, it's Doug Piper from Gourmet Brewing, where we make your day more delicious one sip at a time. If you're like me and you've struggled to cook great steak, you're at the right place because I've recently spent a ton of time perfecting my quick and easy steak recipe. And make sure you stay to the end because I'm going to share with you how I cut the cost of my steak in half or more. Step one, I sous vide from frozen. I start with filling my container to the proper level with fresh water. Then I mount the sous vide stick at an appropriate depth. Now, while I love fresh steak, there is nothing easier than grabbing an aged steak. Then I just drop it right into the sous vide frozen. Clip the bag in place, set the temperature for 133 degrees or 33 degrees Celsius. Step two. Cook long enough to thoroughly tenderize. I'll usually cook a ribeye for an entire afternoon. Tenderloins for about half that time. Step three, prep for a good sear. Open the bag and save the au jus for gravy. This steak is not pretty yet, but dabbing it dry will ensure a good crust. Now sprinkle plenty of salts and spices. Now don't be stingy. These add wonderful flavors to your steak and most of them will fall away anyway. Four, sear it hot and lock in those juices. Heat a dry pan and add about a half pat of butter to one side of your steak and toss it into an already hot pan. Now this may smoke pretty good, but it means you're creating a beautiful crust, so put up with as much of that as you can. Now after about five minutes or so, I'll add another half pat of butter and flip the steak onto the other side. Step five, the best part, serving. Now that we're ready to serve, I find thin slices are best as it minimizes the gristle that sometimes is in lower grades of ribeye. Look at all those delicious juices that are locked into this steak. So check this out, at $6 a pound, you end up with one delicious piece of meat. Awesome. Bonus tip. Early in the video, I mentioned there are ways to save half or more on your steaks. Now, meat packers are nearly everywhere, but you need to look for the ones that have a retail store. Now, their meat is typically lower grade, grass fed, and extremely fresh. And you may have to buy it in bulk. I paid $79.68 for this 13 pound whole ribeye. Now, since it was super fresh, I left it in the fridge for a few weeks of wet aging. After that, it's time to slice into one inch steaks and put them into individual freezer bags. I find putting the smaller bags into larger bags helps keep the various cuts together and minimize freezer burn. Now you'll have lots of delicious steaks cooked straight out of your freezer. I hope you enjoyed this and please share in the comments your best steak tips, recipes, and ways you save costs. That was great by Doug. Always appreciate hearing all the things that he's up to. And I think Doug's going to be with us so he can hop on and say hi to everybody here. Hello, sir. Welcome to the stage. How are you doing? I am great. How are you doing? Doing really good. It's nice to see you again. It's been a while. Uh, 
hopefully we can get together face to face in one of these days pretty soon. Well, I hope so. And I know this wasn't a beer recipe, but you know, if if we get motivated, I've got one right here that we can we can open up and uh, enjoy. <laughs> You're allowed to do whatever recipes you want. You don't have to only do beer recipes to make me and Mike happy, you know. <laughs> well, I had just decided we, that is something uh, my wife and I have kind of done over the past year, or maybe even started before COVID. Uh, we were trying to make Friday nights just a little bit special, but we're busy. And so I didn't want to really do a big complex dinner. And then we found out about these meat packers where you could buy the beef at uh, that ribeye was $6 a pound. And so we went up there, bought this huge piece of meat. And he said, now you got a wet agent. I, I've never done anything like that before. We wet agent, but I mean, you got, it's just two of us. And, and this, this was 11 pounds of ribeye. So we just took it and sliced it up and froze it. And it worked so well. I mean, Lunchtime on Fridays, I'll go down there and grab one of those individual ribeyes because we'll split one. We'll take that, drop that in the sous vide, and then forget about it. And then at, uh, you know, when we're ready to eat, I'll do exactly what I showed in the video. I mean, we'll, we'll take it, dab it dry, uh, take a pat of butter, put it on the steak, and then put it on that hot pan with the spices. And then you slice it and... It, I have learned, you know, with the grass-fed beef, I guess it's a bit tougher. Mm -hmm. But the flavor's actually very good. And so that's where I started just thin slicing it like you would a flank steak. And that is so nice. I mean, I really prefer it that way now. I don't know that I'll ever go back and slice up my own steak. Man, <laughs> thin slicing that and dividing it up between us is just wonderful. So I just thought I would share that. I mean, it's... Not much sous vide in it. I mean, just the, the steak really going from frozen to uh, to fully cooked. But gosh, sous vide is just wonderful for that. <laughs> yeah, we've had a few presentations on, you know, how to make home cooking a lot easier for people. And I think that's one of the overlooked aspects of sous vide. Like you're saying, you can prepackage it, especially buying in bulk like that. You can save a lot of money and then you can just whip them up really quick, especially when a lot of us are working from home these days and it's easier to throw in something three hours before lunch. Yeah, we, we, we love it. So we're, we're going back and, and learning how to do that. And we just kind of fill up our freezer uh, for lunch today. We had a spaghetti and I'd put them in those very same bags. They're just sandwich bags, uh, good quality sandwich bags. Uh, we had had a two portion uh, meal of spaghetti drop that, actually put it in the microwave for a few minutes and then uh, sous vide it the rest of the way. I mean, sous vide is just wonderful for taking things from frozen uh, to ready to serve. And, and nobody talks much about that. Yeah, I use a lot of uh, frozen food in sous vide that it's just very easy to throw a bunch, to prepackage it, throw it in the freezer, and then whenever I need it, uh, I can toss it out. And I'll even, for some of the tougher cuts, like uh, chuck roast or uh, pork shoulder, I'll portion it, sous vide it, because uh, it takes, you know, two, one to two days, and then I'll chill it and then throw it in the freezer. So when I want to reheat it, it's only, you know, an hour to reheat it instead of the whole, you know, one to two days that's already taken care of. Well, what would you recommend on the spices? I'd seen a lot of questions. Uh, you had talked a lot about being careful about the spices in the sous vide. So mine is just the raw meat in the bag and it sits for the afternoon. I typically do it about 133 degrees, although I want to find out what Stefan suggests because I, <laughs> I, he might have actually specific recommendation for grass fit. <laughs> um, but uh, then I just add the spices, you know, right before we cook it. What, what's your recommendation? You've done more of these. Uh, I go back and forth on it. It uh, There are some spices that don't handle being sous vide well, I believe. You know, yesterday we were talking about uh, like black pepper and uh, Mark Webb has given some good examples of multiple reasons why that can be. Um, but sometimes I do use spices going into it with the different rubs just to add flavor and kind of, you know, it evenly coats the outside with the flavor. Um, it's not as strong as when you do it at the end, but kind of just depends what I'm up for these days. And it's uh, it's definitely more versatile if you don't add spices because you can use it in everything. But a lot of times, um, 
when I'm packaging it, I'll use different spices on it just so I can be inspired later. Um, I personally don't taste a huge difference, but I know some people feel very strongly that it, uh, certain spices can be, you know, have off, off flavor after sous vide eating, but I haven't run into it as much myself, uh, over the last five years, probably. So I, I kind of do what makes me happy these days and, uh, normally turns out tasting pretty good for me. <laughs> So what would you recommend for a good sear? I've experimented with mustard and mayonnaise and I, I guess uh, avocado oil and, you know, a little half pat of butter seems to work the best for me. What's your recommendation? Um, yeah, butter works pretty good, especially because it can often brown a little bit itself in the pan. So it adds a little bit more toasty flavor, a little more nutty. Um, a lot of times I'll just use uh, avocado oil because it's, or any any oil with a high smoke point so I can get a decent sear on there. And I have a sous vide torch too. So sometimes I'll, you know, use a cast iron pan and then uh, torch the top of it. And then when I flip it, I can torch the top to kind of even out a little bit of the sear. Uh, but that's generally what works best for me. I'll, uh, if I'm reheating food uh, or um, I won't heat it all the way back up to the original temperature, I'll heat it up a little bit lower and then I'll sear it at the end to kind of bring it up the last few degrees. Um, and if it's fresh food, I will, uh, I'll let it cool a little bit, either on the counter or in just some like cold water for 10 minutes, 15 minutes. And that gives me just an extra one to two minutes maybe on the sear. So it's not a huge amount of time, but it might be another 50% longer that you can sear it. So you can get a little better crust around there without uh, overcooking the middle anymore. Well, the butter is super easy and seems to, uh, Brown it up. I, the torches, every time I've tried the torches, it takes forever. Yeah, you need I, one I of the uh, fast way to do that. You definitely need one of the bigger torches. Can't be like a creme brulee torch. And uh, I, that's why I do the combo a lot of times with it on the uh, on, in a cast iron pan. So it would be like the downside is searing from the cast iron pan and the tops is kind of filling in a little bit of the splotchiness, splotchiness if the steak isn't completely even. But that's a not a hot cast iron pan because otherwise yeah. it seems like that's a recipe to set something on fire. I use the hot cast iron pan and torch the top of it while it's searing and the, the torch? bottom of it. Yeah, I mean the the torch. He hadn't lit know, it. <laughs> the, the torch is uh, you know has uh, thirteen hundred uh, two thousand degrees coming out of it, so I figure it's probably okay with the uh, the stove being uh, you know five hundred or eight hundred sure someone knows the exact specifics and will will correct me in the chat about what the temperatures are but um yeah i generally do that i don't uh like rest the the torch you know bottom on the uh on the cast iron pan or anything like that but i'm usually a good foot away from it or six inches at least <laughs> so so far no flambeau huh no flambeau yeah i'm still here so that's at least a, a good sign but uh <laughs> yeah good cast iron pan with either butter or olive oil works uh, really really well for me and like I said, cooling it a little bit allows uh, a little bit longer sear. So if I want a really good one, that's uh, something that I, I will often turn to. So, well, I'll have to it, ask. it can be a rather smoke, smoky process, but uh, we love doing it. It's so easy. Yeah. And I will say that I like putting the, uh, when I use uh, avocado oil or something like that, I'll put it on the steak itself and not into the pan for similar to your reasons that it's, there's a lot less oil in the pan. And so there's a lot less smoke coming out of it, um, which I found to be a, a good, uh, a good way to at least reduce the, the smokiness a little bit in our New York apartment. I've probably terrified everyone in our apartment building more than once by setting off the alarms. So being a good thorough engineer, I did try other cuts and I'd, I'd like to share for anybody that goes and, and, and tries this. Uh, the first cut that they sold me, well, I, they sold me a tenderloin, which worked out perfect. And then they sold me a sirloin. And wow, is that something else to try and cut into something? I, I, it was like 11 or 12 pounds. Now it was only four or $5 a pound. Wow. But I couldn't hardly cut it with a knife. I couldn't figure out where the grain was. I couldn't begin to figure out where to, how to cut a sirloin. So uh, for those that, you know, go and get one of these pieces of beef, you do your homework before you get a sirloin, because at least for me, it was not obvious how to cut it. And I did eventually mutilate it into some pieces <laughs> of meat, which were pretty good. 
but wow. I mean, I think I needed a bandsaw to really cut that. Um, <laughs> and the t- tenderloin of course was really eat it. Yeah. Valerie beat it into submission. It was, it, you know, I was determined to get some steaks out of it. Um, but then I went back and I, and I told him, I said, man, I, I'm never going to get another sirloin from you guys. I said, what do you really recommend? He says, Oh gosh. He said, I really use the sirloin primarily for hamburger. <laughs> and I said, okay. All right. Not been nice well, to know earlier. <laughs> yeah, it really would have been, but, but it was a good experiment. I would have never known. I wouldn't have never, ever guessed it'd be that hard to cut a sirloin. Yeah. But I mean, truly you need a bandsaw. I had a really sharp knife and I had a cleaver. And I, yeah, I, I needed a bandsaw. <laughs> That's crazy. Yeah, I feel like, uh, you know, like you said, tenderloin's pretty easy. Uh, strip loin's normally pretty easy to break down, but I've never done a, never done a sirloin, and I'm, I'm glad I haven't tried. <laughs> well, it looks like uh, Darren's got some comments there. He says, sirloin has two parts. Top sirloin cap is also known as the pecana. Yeah. I pronounce that right. Sirloin is awesome to sous vide, makes it tender yeah, and flavorful. Yeah, but this one had a fair amount of gristle, so I don't know if that's the grass fed. Or I'm pretty sure my cutting lacked <laughs> a lot of skill. So Darren put in the comments, how do you cut a two-part sirloin? That's what I want to know. <laughs> yeah, how do you break down that's... the whole one? Well, Mike's giving oh, me the... Oh, my gosh. Mike's giving me the time time sign over there, but I have to know what's a what's a beer that you've had lately that we should we should be aware of or checking out. Oh well, I'll, I'll switch that to the cinema camera. So, Sierra Nevada's Celebration Pale Ale. Nice. Uh, not I don't work for them. I'm not advertising it, but I'm telling you, if you like an IPA, this is probably one of the most uh, difficult beers in the world to brew. Uh, Sierra Nevada gets these things, and I've I've gone through the process. Matter of fact, I'm going to have a video coming out on it. But you know they've got some pretty high uh, expectations. They get the hops, they drive them 24/7 to the brewery. The brewery's ready to brew the beer with it, and then they get it to market super fast because they can only produce it when the hops are ready, and it generally sells out by Christmas. So. Highly recommend it. It's, it is one of the most delicious, unique IPAs that you'll ever have. So that, I'm really excited to get mine. I got, got a case early. <laughs> nice. Well, I'll have to look for that showing up in stores hopefully soon. And uh, as always, Doug, it was great to have you on. Appreciate the video. And it was a pleasure talking to you as always. Thank you. Bye-bye. See ya. If you enjoyed Doug's, uh, his video and some of the things we were talking about in the, uh, the afters, please give him some love in the comments. It's always great seeing what Doug is up to. And be sure to check out his website, Gourmet Brewing. Lots of great interviews, beer tours. He is uh, really tight into the beer, um, the whole beer industry. And it's great seeing some of the stuff that he gets on there, plus sous vide beer recipes like he's done for us in the past, which is always very interesting to see as well. So thanks to Doug for coming on.